Welcome to Trial Lawyer Prep. What if you could hang out with trial lawyers and jury consultants? Ask them about connecting with clients and juries more effectively. Then take strategies, tactics, and insights to increase your success. Each week, Elizabeth Larrick takes an in-depth look at how to regain touch with the everyday world, understand the emotional burden of your clients and juries, and use focus groups in this process. Elizabeth is an experienced trial lawyer, consultant, and founder of Larrick Law Firm in Austin, Texas. Her goal is to help you connect with juries and clients in order to improve your abilities in the courtroom. Now, here's Elizabeth. Hi there, it's Elizabeth. I want to jump in before we start this episode and tell you a little bit about my guest, John Prudhomme. He is with CPM Injury Lawyers. He got his undergrad at the University of California, went to law school at SMU School of Law, and has been in the Austin area for many years now. It has tried many cases of lots of variety. He and I have worked on a few, and we will talk about that in the episode. If you have questions for John or want to get a hold of him, just know his contact information will be in the show notes. Okay, let's get to it. Hello, and welcome back to the podcast, Trial Lawyer Prep. I am your host, Elizabeth Larrick, and today we have a guest joining us, a very good friend who is local. I know we have a lot of folks that come uh, in here recently, we have people from Montana come, but now we've got a nice local Austin lawyer joining us. Hello, John, how are you? Doing well, how are you? Doing great, doing great, trying to get through this heat uh, a little bit. <laughs> if you're just now listening to this episode, when it comes out, it'll be July. I think it's the week of almost July 4th. If not, you're catching up. Hey, listen, it's in Texas. We're today, I think they're forecasting the first 100 day, 100 degree weather day. So we got a little warm for a while. Yeah. Yeah. But I wanted to bring John on because his firm has done focus groups with me before, but he has had one that's come all the way to the gamut. They went to trial. And so I really wanted to bring him on to talk about it because he had a pretty interesting piece of evidence that we sometimes find in our cases, which is video footage. And so we want to talk about that. I wanted him to talk about his experience and kind of give y'all kind of a backstage view of, of what happened and how the virtual focus group helped and kind of how we set it up. So, you know, that's what we're here to talk about. So John, tell me, now, first of all, let me give a little background. So I'm really not even sure how Chris and I got, I think Chris just, remember how we end up getting connected. I want to say it's probably through BNI, but which is a networking business networking thing. And he came to me and you guys had a super complicated medical device. And guys, this was complicated. Like there were just drilled in the brain and had lasers. And so it was this super complicated thing. And so we end up doing several really long ones, right? So we had these long ones and um, they end up having a very good result in that case, but we had a little different thing here. So tell us, John, a little bit about the case and how come you wanted to do a virtual focus group? Sure. Yeah. So that was, yes, this was a very different case from that, that uh, medical device case. That was a wild one. I think we focus grouped like four different theories of that case, trying to figure that one out. Yeah, so this one was much more straightforward. This is a, a fuel tanker rear-ending a dump truck on, on I-35. You know, seemed from our perspective to be pretty straightforward. We had a video from the dash cam of the oil tanker that we thought made it pretty clear. Video showed our guy going pretty slow, but the oil tanker essentially just plows into the back of him. So it seemed pretty straightforward. And then we got two plus years into the case and we hadn't gotten an offer and everyone seemed to be digging in on the other side that this was a disputed liability case. And so while we we thought it was pretty straightforward, I definitely started to get a little bit paranoid, especially as we started to get, I think, maybe three, four months out from trial and there didn't seem to be any indication of a settlement coming at any point soon. So that's when we reached out to you to see, you know, hey, can we get get a group of people in here to see, get another perspective on on what, what the defense might be looking at from, from that side and what a jury might think of that video. Yes. And what John is being so polite about is it wasn't just that it was a video. Okay. And it was a nice crisp video, by the way, this wasn't like one of those crummy ones. And also his, his client was getting on the interstate y'all. It's not just driving real slow on the, it's getting on. And 
the fact was that turned out like why did this happen was the fuel tanker driver was sound asleep totally admitted he was sound asleep so look like super clear liability so john comes to me and he's like i must be missing something because there's no offer feels like a super clear situation we got video so we said okay let's throw it to a focus group but also i think the other thing that was a little bit precarious was the venue right so venue a little bit north of us that's just different different venue i will say it would some few different factors that we want you guys want to make sure because you know sometimes we can spot what the fence is hanging in their hat on and sometimes we can't <laughs> and so this is one of those places where you know like you said they litigated for two years and originally of course the position originally was okay dude says it's 100 percent his fault he's sleeping and now it's a 50 50 situation so a couple of things just to test out so we we took it to the focus group and we did a pretty simple straightforward right didn't want to put our fingers on the scale one way or the other we just did pretty neutral straightforward things so i had some people from the venue what were you going to say john Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, we had a, you know, one of the first things, one of the first depositions in the case was a, a company rep for the oil tanker company saying that it was 50-50, which we thought was great for us. <laughs> and then as as we got a year in, a year longer into the case, then all of a sudden nothing had changed as far as, as far as they were going. We were trying to figure out, wait, they, wait, so they were serious about the 50-50. <laughs> yes, yes. So we, we get in the focus group and, you know, John, you're watching, right? What were some of the things going through your mind as you're as you're watching these folks digress or digest, I should say, into the into the video? Well, yeah. And so the way that the way that you did it was you showed the video and you asked them what they thought about it. And that had me terrified because they were they were willing to put a decent amount on on uh, my client for for what speed they were going at that point. At that point, they didn't have the knowledge that he was asleep. That did certainly change their mind a little bit. But I mean, even after we went through the different iter iterations, as they learned more about the facts, they were still ready to put at least five, ten percent at a minimum on my guy, despite the fuel tanker driver falling asleep behind the wheel of a, a, a loaded fuel tanker. <laughs> so that was pretty surprising and, and a little discouraging, but it certainly gave us some insight as to at least where the defense was coming from, what to expect from a jury up there. Because like you said, it was a group of people from that area. And most importantly, told us that we needed to change what our strategy was as far as approaching Fort I or opening and obviously our, our point of direct. And, and, and I think this, yeah, this was before we had taken liability expert depots in the case. And so that allowed us at least a little bit of runway to change change some of our our theory on liability that we thought was just we had already checked that box. Mm -hmm. Right, right, and and all, mostly for liability, but we also did a little bit of damages work too. So was it what was it that were some, some takeaways about the damages that that the focus group told you? Yeah, and so for damages, I mean, when I when I first reached out reached out to you, I asked you purely about the video i was just getting a little paranoid about about liability and i think we talked a little bit about damages then but wasn't really thinking too much about about focus grouping damages we had a, a veteran as a client who was you know had a back surgery he had been recommended for spinal cord stimulators he had done the trials he had been through quite a bit of medical treatment so we weren't terribly concerned about that but we we decided to at least throw in a little bit at the end. And that also was extremely helpful as far as figuring out where to focus because they were less interested in the, the treatment that he had. And they, they ended up being far more interested, and this is credit to you, Elizabeth, in the his family and how it was going to affect his family and kind of the change from being, you know, this guy was essentially Paul Bunyan before and the way that his family was going to be impacted as far as his inability to do things moving forward. They were far more focused on that, which ended up being true of our, our jury in this case, than they really were as far as what he was dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis, which ended up being extremely helpful as far as, again, his, his direct. We shifted things around as far as what the plan was there. Yeah. We also you ran into the collateral source problem. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> which 
with the military thing in, in here and just give you guys a little kind of behind the curtain, this particular venue it is a very good thing because you're going to have veterans on the panel. You're going to have people. So it was like, okay, like we want to make sure we talk about this. And then of course, the flip side of that is, well, we got some collateral source things pinging around in people's brains. And of course it came up and naturally wasn't of it even remotely true for the case, John. Yeah, there was no insurance coverage whatsoever, let alone the you know the collateral source is- issues that they were concerned about. It ended up getting worse when we got to trial. When uh, most of our panel ended up being employees of the VA and the local hospitals around, so it just <laughs> just kind of compounded itself. <laughs> and, yeah, also there. problem, right? So. Tell me a little bit about, I mean, you know, we ran this group, you know, anything else that like thinking at that time that you came, you walked away with thinking, okay, we're going to need to move some things around. Anything else that were takeaways from the focus group that you guys changed things for for your trial approach? You know, the approach on liability, the approach on, on talking about his family as the one being impacted. I mean, obviously we get so caught in the weeds as far as we're looking at a jury charge, which is what are his damages? What is he dealing with as far as medical expenses, pain and suffering, impairment, those types of things. But that doesn't mean that that's necessarily all that they want to hear about. And so really, like, that was one of the biggest things that changed. I know I already mentioned that as far as new things, you know, honestly, the only on liability, just to kind of dig into that further, we shifted our liability approach to focusing on, I think it was something that, that you brought up, uh, when we were talking to them that really it's funny to watch them work in real time as they're talking through the issues and the issue of the highway not having a minimum speed was something that was pretty surprising to everyone and it became a huge deal for them and the focus group so we made it a huge part of our we took it a little bit further we we pulled out the the statute on obstructing the roadway and started and focused on that hard with the defense experts with our expert and you know really hammered it home throughout opening and pretty much every witness that we had related to liability it kind of shifted our entire approach to how we were we were dealing with the liability aspect the one thing you know i would say that i wish we had focus group more we talked about it a little bit but i wasn't too worried about it as they had done surveillance which we definitely didn't give as much attention to as we should have. And it ended up being a pretty big deal for the jury. It's some bad rulings on that 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 we weren't really expecting, but I wish we had spent a little bit more time getting people's thoughts on that part of it. But yeah, I mean, those were the two big things is focusing on the impact to his family and then just really shifting our liability focus beyond, hey guys, he was asleep. Do you need yeah. any more than that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's what I was going to say. Like the other thing that was like super surprising was, and again, if you drive up and down 35 often and frequently, like it's a blur. So we had one person plant this idea that there is a minimum and then everyone adopted it. And it was like, and I had to say like, okay, there is no minimum. Okay. Just so we're clear. But people like, so that was a huge thing that like kind of caught traction. And it's one of those things where, it's it's very it's like persuasion, right? Like that had so much credibility over, right? Like literally the video of like this dump truck is getting up to speed to get on the highway. And they, you know, so I think that was like, okay, all right, this is good. This is something you could never have predicted that they were going to create. <laughs> yeah, right. And create a law that was going to penalize your client. They couldn't have cared less that he was getting up to speed. It- it didn't matter to them at all. I guess people have enough experience on, on the highway, or at least on this highway, that they were so annoyed that he was going not close to the actual maximum speed limit that, that they put all that stuff out the window and they just, they just focused on the fact that he was going that speed. And yeah, really, that minimum speed thing really got in their mind and, and took off for a while, I think, until you, you told them there was no minimum <laughs> yeah. speed limit, which is why we took it further when we saw the when we, we went to the to trial and said, this is the law on obstructing the roadway. This is the law on impeding traffic. He wasn't doing any of these. We got their experts to agree that that he wasn't violating any laws with how he was driving that day. I think that helped turn it a little bit. But man, I will tell you, people do not like people driving slow. 
<laughs> it's apparently more offensive than falling asleep behind the wheel. That's what I, that, that was my other comment was, you know, when we when we think about doing an 18 wheeler case, a commercial vehicle case, like we kind of look for these like, distracted driving. Are we fatigued? And sometimes we get that out of people that say, oh, well, was he over hours? Like very kind of rarely, but it happens. But in this situation, there literally was 100% proof. The guy had signed on the statement. I fell asleep. And they were not concerned one iota about this guy and being over hours or or anything. And they, they yeah, no concern there. Like more pissed about the guy <laughs> in the dump truck. Um, I know it's like we spend all this time digging into these facts. Fell asleep. This is the best case. All that stuff. And I just feel stupid every time. Like we talk. We got to talk to the jury afterwards. The focus group. We sleep. The people that are making the decisions on these cases, they don't care about that stuff at all. <laughs> Everything that we get so excited about. Yeah. I mean, the other thing, too, that we really wanted to test, which was the flip-flop, meaning they were, yep, I fell asleep. It's written in my company, in the company policies or the, you know, the after documents that they fill out. And then we go to depositions two years later and it's no, 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 like. This was definitely this guy's fault. He had a mechanical error, which there was zero proof of any kind of mechanical error. But was that okay? And they were just like, yeah, we expect that. Like we expect yeah. companies to totally flip flop on you and, and and say that. So it really wasn't they expected that kind of behavior. And I see that often in focus groups where we're trying to see, does this have traction? Like, does this make people upset? And they've now come to just, that's accepted. And the focus group ended up being consistent with trial. You know, when we talked to the jury afterwards, they loved our guy. They thought he was credible. There was nothing about what he was saying that they thought wasn't truthful. And they hated the corporate rep for the other company. The same guy that, that testified to 50-50. They, they didn't like him at all. It didn't change any of their thought process as far as liability. Nothing mm -hmm. at all. They thought he was asleep. They didn't think for a second that he wasn't asleep. They didn't buy the 50, the, you know, they, they, they came up with this theory that he had just dozed off and he wasn't fully asleep. They didn't buy that at all, but it still didn't change the, your guy was still driving too slow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So let's flip to trial. You guys get to trial. You, you've got this panel and you're thinking, okay, we had a panel. This is on steroids worst kind of panel we want. <laughs> so tell me a little about, and again, just for you guys, like, you know, don't, you know, in anticipation, it, the jury actually didn't get the case, right? They end up settling right before closing arguments. So, and, you know, we're not going to talk about that. That's confidential. However, we get to talk about everything else. And I'm so excited that you guys talk to the jurors to get their feedback. So tell us a little bit about the makeup of the jury and kind of how it was, you know, this, the focus group panel on steroids, basically. Yeah, yeah. So it was, it was, you know, six men, six women, really, I think we had like four nurses, we had two hospital administrators, we had a, it, it was awful. We almost busted the panel. And this was the good panel. We This is the good, the good 12 that we ended up with. Not even joking. It was an insane panel. But yes, yeah, so we ended up with yeah, four nurses, two hospital administrators, a billing person at a medical practice, three VA administrators, one guy who just wouldn't answer any questions and didn't fill out his, his jury questionnaire. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and I don't know how he ended up on there. And then we had one other. I think he was, oh, he worked at Tesla. <laughs> it was like a plant, oh. plant operator at Tesla or something. <laughs> anyway, so. So a great yeah, panel. So, that, so it sounds, yeah. sounds, sounds perfecto. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was it was pretty terrifying. We were we were definitely scared of them the whole time. We definitely were trying to with all the nurses on there, we definitely tried to focus more on the severity of the injuries and, and the medical, maybe a little bit more than we had planned, because it it wasn't really a tug at your heartstrings type of group. Very one thing I will say for them is Man, they they listened to everything. They were intent. No one was dozing off. There was not a. They were all. And when we talked to them afterwards, they were all fascinated by the case. A little bit more so than I would have hoped. I would have thought it would just be more outraged at the guy falling asleep behind the wheel. But we did not get any of that. <laughs> but yeah, just just a brutally bad. Uh, and then you mentioned kind of one of the now there were a couple of less than desirable rulings that you guys got, and and one of the 
probably the the bigger ones that probably couldn't anticipate because I feel like the law is really clear in Texas, which is the admission of the full police report, which is like pretty much never happens. And so that had some nuggets that planted some seeds that couldn't really be overcome because there was no, literally no evidence anywhere, right? I think that's the thing that probably hurt us the most on our guy's speed is there was a, a part of the police report that mentioned our guy having mechanical issues, which like you mentioned earlier, there's zero evidence of, of any mechanical issues. And so that that got in, that got in front of the jury, obviously, once they finally, and that was the other thing is we, we didn't know it was getting in until the third day. And so we, we couldn't plan for it. Oh, just assumed it wasn't. <laughs> right, right. But yeah, we, we couldn't get a ruling based law and he just, he held it, he held it, he held it. And then the third day we finally got that ruling, but it was a little too late to do damage control uh, or to do too much damage control. So yeah. that was pretty harmful. I think that's probably what would hurt us a decent amount as far as well obviously i don't know what the jury would have done but at least in our minds it hurt us a decent amount uh, mm -hmm. on the speed so yeah we had that one that was pretty bad and then you mentioned collateral source we had a pretty bad collateral source ruling where one of their experts was allowed to testify to what the for example an epidural steroid injection reimbursement from a health insurance company would be just for the physician, not for the facility. So the only evidence that they have is our bills and the reimbursement rate for those bills for a physician would be $200 or something mm -hmm. like that. They were speaking straight to that billing juror right there like, hey, 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 <laughs> there's nothing, nothing to be yep. done. Tell me a little bit about the surveillance, because I know that this is an issue that a lot of people face. And it's unfortunate that sometimes we get that surveillance literally on the doorstep of trial. Like, oops, here it is. We, you know, surveillance them for two weeks. Like, <laughs> we didn't see it. What was kind of the nature of the surveillance? You know, I'll just kind of back up a little bit, because our guy, like I said, he's he was basically Paul Bunyan, you know, Army Ranger, all this stuff. And so he doesn't look hurt when he's sitting there on a day-to-day -day basis. He's no, he, still... I mean, when he says Paul Bunyan, this person, six, three, almost six, four, and just, you know, a brick wall of muscle. And I did see pictures of him working out. <laughs> he did like to do some muscles and, and, and do the weightlifting. So, okay, back to you, John. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, he hasn't, you know, obviously he hasn't worked out since the wreck, but I mean, when you've got 25 years of, of that type of intense <laughs> routine going on, it doesn't just go away overnight. So, you know, so he doesn't, he didn't look bad and he could still obviously do a lot of things that, you know, a lot of us can't do now. <laughs> so he, you know, the surveillance showed him, you know, lifting up bags of ice and bending over and picking up an ice chest. You know, the thing that we did have going for us is he did have a uh, spinal cord simulator in at the time. And he was, I think, like five or six months post discectomy. So, you know, we address the surveillance through his doctors. These are the things you would expect him to be doing, that type of stuff. But, you know, he's also a pretty successful guy. And so he's got a boat and he's got nice cars and he's got an awesome family. And so the part that hurt us, I don't think was necessarily what he was physically doing. It was that this guy looks like he's living the life. Why are we going to give him this much money? Mm -hmm. And that was the biggest part that another ruling that we thought would, would go our way is that you know, we didn't expect them to show a picture of the boat. They even got to ask him how much the boat cost. Do a couple, couple different things there that we, we just were never anticipating would actually get in and, and, and should have planned for better, most likely. It's, it, you know, certainly influenced the jury as far as what they would be willing to award. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, honestly, as we sit here today, I don't even know how we would address those specific aspects of it. I think we pivoted pretty well as far as addressing the physical limitations that he had and why he was doing some of the things he did versus what he was able to do before through his surgeon, through the life care planner, talking about those types of things. 
but I would have been a lot more comfortable if we had figured out through a focus group what what because when we talked to the jurors afterwards it was the surveillance was a pretty big deal it was meaningful to them and I think at least I a lot of times discount it because you know it's sleazy it's shady people see it that way and they did but then they also actually watched it yeah (laughs) but then they were also putting it in both categories like well (laughs) the good and the bad exactly that's the best way to put it. There were so many things that I think we see sometimes as black and white. This is either good for us or bad for us. And man, they put it in both categories a lot of the time. Yeah. And so I think one of the things that we talked about was you guys did get to talk to them afterwards. We've talked a lot about that, but tell me a little bit about kind of the feed off of them that you guys were thinking as far as like verdict amount, which end up probably being like, you know, trust your gut. That's why you went ahead and went ahead and got it settled. So tell us a little bit about their feedback on numbers. Yeah, I think we probably would have ended up maybe about half of what we settled for as far as a verdict goes. Very, very happy we were able to to get it done before it went out to them. Yeah, they were, they just, they weren't buying the numbers. We had a life care plan, a great life care planner, you know, the both categories thing. They loved our life care planner. They they thought he was the best witness of, of the entire case other than our client. But they they just they were not buying the amounts. You know, we talked about the nurses and the administrators and things like that. It, maybe it's a county thing, but they they just they were not buying the full bill charges. You know, collateral source in, injected into the case or not, it just wasn't something that that they were going to be willing to, to go with. Mm-hmm. So, which let me just wit- pause there, which was really important for your client because he had done these trial spinal cord stimulators he refused i wouldn't say refused he made a choice it's not going to have narcotics it's never going to take narcotics because he had small kids teenagers at the house so his thing was i'll try the spinal cord stimulators which worked however by the time trial came he had not gotten the permanent one so the permanent ones were in there and that was really probably the most important thing i would say yeah Yeah, for him because you know he was he was a nice guy you know didn't want a lot for pain and suffering and we fashioned that with our focus group by the way we really looked at okay here is what he needs and there really wasn't in the focus group there wasn't a lot of like guff about it right other than like wait a second he can go get this you know with the collateral source thing like oh no so anyhow just wanted to like plant that in there because the life care planner was a really big piece of like hey, this has to happen in order for him to have relief, you know, so. It was, it was, I mean, it was the biggest part of our damage model by far. That's, we put a lot of effort into that. We put a lot, a lot of effort into, you know, kind of focusing on that and open and, and obviously through, through all the doctor's testimony as far as trying to prove up the life care plan, including the defense experts. And that was the crazy thing is, we didn't really have a whole lot of dispute as far as the actual treatment that was going to be needed in the future for him. They had four medical experts. Three of them agreed that he was going to need essentially everything that was in the life care plan. It it came down to the cost. And so they weren't sitting there saying, the jury wasn't sitting there saying, we don't think he doesn't need any of this treatment. It's just he's not going to have to pay this amount for this. And so we're not going to award him that. That really ended up being the biggest deal. We were never able to to really get over that collateral source in their mind. (laughs) Plus the boat. (laughs) Oh, that, yeah. Yeah. Going out and and buying a boat while you're getting all this treatment with a bunch of medical bills sitting out there probably ended up being our... (laughs) Well, and that's also one of those things where, you know, when thinking now, now that you've gone through, you've, you actually got to go to, you saw their case, right? And then you got to hear what resonated, like they were, had a lot of riding on your guy and him being super active and buying a boat and like the surveillance, which, you know, a lot of them do that, but you know, when they, all their experts agree, you're not really <laughs> with your experts. There's not like was that really what they're hanging their hat on? And it, it, and it was, and they did it. Yeah. It's, you know, it's funny, again, we get so caught up in all this stuff. You know, we spent so much time trying to figure out how to get to all of their experts. And really at the end of the day, the jury didn't care about any of their experts. They cared about the boat. (laughs) They cared about the costs and they, they just cared about what he was physically still able to do for his family. 
that was and they saw him moving around in those videos and i i think it hurt it hurt our argument that you know he's not going to be able to do these things he's young too and so they're not seeing what it's going to look like in 15 20 years and you know we tried to hammer that home with with all of our our experts and doctors and, and even even the client up there but yeah, I definitely would say I'm guilty of focusing way too much on trying to get to their experts and, and what our guys are going to say and not really focusing on some of these things that ultimately matter to them more. And, and the surveillance is one of those that mm-hmm. you definitely don't spend enough time addressing. And I think, you know, it like people are like right now and in the past year, like people are very conscious about costs and expenses. And when they go to the grocery store, it goes up like when they get the gas pump, not so much, but the groceries and like (laughs) things that it's like, they're so much more cost conscious. Plus you had, unfortunately, a jury full of experts (laughs) on that kind of stuff. And then they, you know, they are not as empathetic, like, you know, like, you know, windfall or whatever. So the other question that I have, because again, you've got this great experience of, we talked about your client before we talked about the focus group and kind of what his perspective was. How did his perspective change, like sitting through, going through trial lists and everything? Like, you know, how did his perspective change about his case? You know, he was very, very involved in this case. Great guy. I'm one of the better clients I've ever had, for sure. Very smart, which sometimes can be difficult to manage expectations, especially because he knows exactly what's going on. And so we had talked about the focus group in pretty good detail. We picked the jury. The jury he didn't really totally understand what was happening with the jury for the first couple of days though i would say he also gave one of the best directs that i've ever seen anyone give it was incredible and so they really liked him but i think he started to see as the and his, his wife was very helpful in, in helping him get there on this he finally got to the point where you know we didn't really have any sort of offer to consider until so we started we we were going to close on the monday after we started and so we got back in the courtroom on monday and and that was the first time it was going to go to the jury at 9 a.m that we got our first real offer and so he didn't really have anything to consider before then that was the point i think where he you know finally he was finally able to realize like oh this jury is terrifying. We had talked about it a little bit on <laughs> yeah. Friday. We had talked about it a little bit over the weekend. But, you know, we didn't really, we didn't have a choice. So we, there wasn't really much context to, to have that discussion. And then when we sat down and we're, we're really talking about, you know, whether we want to put this in their hands or not, they were definitely both able to acknowledge, yeah, this, I don't know what they're going to do. And, and it could end pretty poorly uh, and could end significantly less than, you know, they were never going to, or amount or anything yeah but it might have been a lot less than we were talking about it as, as far as well so yeah he he kind of saw the evolution and then he didn't talk to them but he overheard them talking to the defense attorneys afterwards and i don't think he could have ever been happier about a decision he's made <laughs> <laughs> yeah again you have this unique experience that if things do settle quite often like in the middle of trial but most of the time it's at a different point, not right. So, I mean, it is sometimes happen right before closing, but when your client gets that experience and then the sitting as a fishbowl and like seeing how it's all swirling around and thinking like, this is not at all what I thought was going to happen, <laughs> you know, but again, you guys didn't have even a single offer to consider. So it wasn't like you, you know, there was any kind of waffling because like, hey, we're going like, this is it. Yeah, so Yeah, no, absolutely Super helpful. Okay. Awesome experience here. So, you know, you got to go all the way through, obviously thinking back, not that we're, you know, using hindsight, probably would have done folks group on that surveillance to see how, how it would have nailed and how you could have maybe, because again, as we heard in in your focus group, just on your video for liability, we had people on both sides of the coin, right? And they're tussling it out you know, and hearing basically their strong points and why and all that good stuff. And so that's, you know, helped you kind of shape where we had to go and what we had to lean into. And hopefully the surveillance would have provided you kind of the same thing because normally they do, right? You're going to folks group, hopefully it's good. You know, there's a good mix that you're going to have people on both sides and they're going to be talking about their opinions either way. So anything else you feel like 
you would have focus grouped or maybe you know I'm wondering, oh, on the surveillance funny. Well, yeah, uh, well, definitely on the surveillance. I think you said, yeah, if, yeah. if there had been more time, then you get you would definitely would have done one on the surveillance. So just one one note I also learned at trial on that surveillance is so they brought the PI alive and he testified that he had done surveillance on our guy a week before trial. No video shockingly produced, which is interesting. But yeah, so, you know, I think I talked to my client about I doubt I don't think they're going to probably not probably not going to be any more surveillance at this point. I was wrong. Um, definitely need to, to note that in the future. As far as focus grouping stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think we've been trying to figure out different ways to address the, you know, the elephant in the room as far as health insurance or lack of health insurance and stuff. I think that might be, you know, I don't know if that's a, a full half day focus group or it worked into a, a damage focus group, something like that. But right. there's definitely need to figure out some better way, at least. I don't know. And, and maybe it's just, maybe it's just not possible with certain juries, ours in particular, but you know, figuring out some way to better address that you can't consider health insurance in this case, we need to not consider it or however we need to get there from that perspective. You know, the method we tried was was through some of our doctors, but yeah. I, it clearly did not land with them. Well, and again, you had expert jurors. So that's, you know, I think with a different panel, but again, you know, it's kind of one of those things where, holy moly, I know you guys tried to bust the panel and the judge is not going to let you do that. But, you know, that's kind of one of the other things too, is one of these gambles that we have, especially with this. And here in Texas, we have this, you know, like the war is on the bills right now. And like, oh, everyone's got a billing expert and oh, it's this, it's that. And, you know, and that's where the, you know, if you're running a car wreck or any kind of like, that's where they're kind of staking a little bit of a claim, which makes a lot of people worried we do we've done lots of focus groups on the, these billing experts and like the challenges and stuff like that and so yeah i think it's a matter of figuring out how to talk to talk, talk to people yeah and you know i think we've gotten decent at least at, at attacking the billing experts and undermining their credibility and i don't you know honestly their their billing experts didn't have credibility with with the jury when we talked to them. I don't think that was meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. I think it's just, you know, frankly, the defendants would have been better off not bringing billing experts because it was already in their mind. It was something that was going to affect their result anyway. I don't know exactly what the the path is, but I think I've definitely spent way too much time trying to figure out how to attack their billing experts and less time focusing on how do we address that elephant in the room through our people. Because right. that seemed to be the much bigger issue for them. Right. And that's a lot of the results that we've seen is like, it, this is a side issue. Like you're trying to create, you're kind of distracting me from, from this other thing. Anyone can come in and say, oh, it should be less. Right. But ultimately, like who has the ability to negotiate? Right. And that's like, you're asking your client, right? Did you negotiate this? Like, as we sit here today, if you go get this in six months, do you have any idea what it's going to cost? No. What are you relying on? Well, the guidance that I've gotten from this guy who that's his whole job, right? Like, and, you know, if it's more, if it's less, like, you know, it's kind of one of those things, like, how do you, like, where do the seeds plant? And I think you've nailed it, which is, I think it's almost everybody, right? It's your doctors, it's the life care planner, it's even your client, because he is fine now, but he's a young guy. And it could be, I mean, because Maybe he wakes up one morning and it's different. That's happened to him before. <laughs> yeah, so, no, exactly. That uh, so, happened a lot during this case. <laughs> yes, awesome. Well, hey, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your experience. I know a lot of people are curious about virtual. You guys have been early adopters. And I think, you know, thinking through this case and why you came to do one. And, and just to be, you know, totally black and white here, like John did not do it all day. We did two hours. Like that was it. And in those two hours, like this is all the nuggets that he got to really reframe liability. Yeah, I don't, I don't think, frankly, because we did, we did at least one in-person focus group. And honestly, I don't think it from the other case before, I don't think it changed anything to have it virtual, really. Watching them work, thinking through these things and talking through these things is fascinating. You learn quite a bit about how we get lost in our little bubbles 
our little legal bubbles. Uh, when we... <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm just thinking We're... through like if we had wanted to do one for in person, like that would have been an exponential larger cost because we all would have had to get in our cars and go up there and get a place and, you know, versus having everybody tune in on on Zoom, which, you know, convenient for sure. So Awesome. Well, John, if there's anybody out there listening who may be on the fence about virtual focus groups, like what advice would you give them? Yeah, I would encourage you to do it if you've got anything that anything that you think is going to be a potential issue in in your case, or you're curious about how a jury is going to think about it, or step back for a minute because you think something is all locked in, and maybe reconsider as far as the different ways that people might think of things outside of our our lawyer world. Yeah, I definitely encourage you to do it because it, it definitely changed our, our mindset on this one. And I'm not, if we had approached it kind of with the fastball, this guy fell asleep and screw the rest of you approach that we were kind of going with it, I think it would have turned them off quite a bit. So yeah, I would, I would definitely encourage you. If nothing else, it's, it's fascinating to hear how they think about things. And it'll certainly change at least one or two things about the way how you approach it. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, John, for joining us today. I know it helps to hear other people's experience and you had a pretty fun one here recently. And this was, this was just in May, right? So I mean, we're, we're, yep. we're digging the gold out now before we, <laughs> we move on to that next case. So thanks so much. Wild for ride. Time. Finish June one. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right. Well, Thank you all here for listening in to this episode. If you have questions about John and his case, maybe you have a similar case, which actually happens pretty often when I have my listeners email me and say, ooh, 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 you talked about that. All of John's contact information will be in the show notes. I know he is happy to talk about the case and how they did approach things and what they use. So if you want to reach out to him, his contact will be in the show notes. Also, if you're curious about doing a virtual focus group and maybe want to dip your toe in the water, there'll be a link there if you want to talk to me about doing one of those. Like John mentioned, like I mentioned, got all kinds of styles and flavors for everybody out there. So if you have a question or if you're curious, please book a time to talk to me. It's for free. Other than that, if you like this podcast, please rate review on your favorite platform that helps other people find it. And until then, thank you so much. 